coming out. Thank you to ORF for, for hosting me, uh, not just tonight, but also as a, as a researcher here in India, conducting my own research for the last few weeks. Um, I'm very appreciative and, and honored to be uh, here to share some, some thoughts with you today. Um, I want to try to do three things uh, before we engage in more of a, of a conversation. The first is to give my impressions of what the militant milieu looks like in Pakistan today. Uh, the, the initial title for this talk had been sort of a US perspective, I think, on Pakistan supported terrorism. While I, I have written and I, I make no bones about the fact that I see some of these groups as continuing to benefit from state support, I think that the ground reality is far more complicated. Uh, Mr. Balachandran and I were speaking before we came in, and uh, I was making the point that, that, that had been made many times before, um, that Pakistan today is, is both a supporter and a victim of terrorism. Um, and so I want to first assess where we see uh, militancy evolving. Secondly, I'd like to talk about what I see as some of the barriers to dismantling the militant infrastructure in Pakistan. Uh, most important, of course, is going to be the continued perceived utility of some of these actors geopolitically, uh, primarily against India, though no longer exclusively. Um, we are now on the receiving end in the U.S. as well, uh, particularly in Afghanistan. And then finally, how the U.S. approach to this has evolved. Um, and then I think we can engage in a, in a nice uh, conversation uh, and, and welcome questions. In terms of how, you know, and I'll, I'm, first of all, I should also say that I, I do not work for the government. I'm an academic and a, a think tanker um, like those here at ORF. So these are my own views and, and do not represent those of the United States government in any way, shape, or form. Um, although I will try to represent what I believe to be some of the thinking there in, in the conversations that I've had. From my own perspective, uh, I would suggest that the, the militant milieu in Pakistan has become much more uh, complicated and um, complex um, in the last 10 years. There's a welter of different outfits today. And indeed, uh, some are fighting on behalf of the Pakistani state uh, or with the support of it. Some are fighting against the Pakistani state. Some are doing both. Um, some we know by name, Lashkar e Taiba, Chariki Taliban, Pakistan. Others fall under what could be termed best um, not even an umbrella, but rather a label, like Punjabi Taliban, which is a whole host of different networks of actors. Um, if one were to try to um, understand this group, uh, I would suggest that, that the best way that we might do it would be by the loci of, of action um, or direction. And I would point to five uh, loci that, that I think exist today, broadly speaking. The first are those that are active in Afghanistan, um, which is where I would argue all of these groups come together. Most jihadist groups in Pakistan today are also active in Afghanistan. The second would be those that are India-centric, um, such as the Lashkar e Taiba. Um, the third would be those that are primarily sectarian in nature, like the Lashkar e Jangvi, which targets primarily the Shia. The fourth would be those that are engaged in revolutionary jihad, which would mean fighting against the Pakistani state itself, not against the population like the Shia, but against the army and the, the civilian government. And then fifth would be those who have absorbed what I would term Al-Qaeda's global jihadist ideology. And by global jihad, I mean engaging in out-of-area attacks against US and allied Western forces. Um, so the targeting of uh, Westerners and Jews in the 2611 attacks, for example, would, would be an example of an India-centric group blending that with some global jihadist tendencies. Now, these are useful loci in terms of lodestars to understand what the different objectives and ideologies and areas of operation are. But I would come back to the fact that there has been a great blending of these different actors over the last 10 years. Afghanistan, again, being the place where I think everybody comes together today. And without going through sort of all the um, inflection points over the last decade that, that are probably familiar to a lot of people, uh, you know, 9-11, the decision to ban groups in 2002, the beginning of the peace process in 2004, the Lal Masjid in 2007, which have, you know, been seen as a series of betrayals by some of these actors. I think it's safe to say 
that um, the militant milieu as it exists today is far more fragmented and less organization-centric than it used to be. That doesn't mean that the Pakistani state doesn't still try to preserve the, quote, good jihadists and target the, quote, bad jihadists. It just means that doing so is, I would argue, more difficult than it used to be. Um, and one would like that they would wake up and take notice of this fact and just treat all of these actors as they are, which are militants that need to be uh, dismantled. Now, I do want to point to what I think are several important phenomena over the last decade that help inform what I see as the nature of the threat going forward before I come to what I believe to be you know, many of the barriers to action against them, which is, I think, in some ways, a more interesting and important area to focus because it gets at the complexity of the problem. Um, the, the, the first phenomenon that, that I would like to point to is, is what I would term sort of a, a petri dish phenomenon, which is that as a result of a series of, of uh, events and the wholesale roundup of militants in 2003 following the attempts on Musharraf's life, the peace process beginning in 2004 after which a number of actors uh, who had been fighting in Kashmir were confined to camps even while others were allowed to continue to fight. The incursions and then subsequent peace deals into the federally administered tribal areas. A lot of the actors that had been um, confined to their camps or rounded up after the 2003 attacks going to the tribal areas in 2005, 2006, 2007. What we've had, and then of course the encouragement for all of these actors to go fight in Afghanistan, what we've had is we've had all of these different groups sort of coming together in what I would suggest is a petri dish of militancy. So you mix all these different groups that have all these different objectives, different capabilities, some are more organizationally coherent like the Lashkar Taiba, some are far less organizationally coherent by the end of the decade like the Jaishi Mohammed which had fragmented, and you mix them all together in a petri dish and it's quite clear exactly what's going to come out. Um, and this is one of the problems, is that I would argue the Pakistani state is faced with a situation in which it continues to support certain actors, but doesn't necessarily know who those actors are working with, and you get unintended consequences as a result. Okay, that is not to exculpate the Pakistani state. It's to say that they are increasingly playing with fire, but they play with fire nonetheless, right? Um, the second phenomenon that I think is important uh, is what I would term the flea market phenomenon, all right? And this, I was having a conversation with a, a friend of mine who is a, a journalist in Islamabad, and he was explaining to me, you know, and I saw this later on as I traveled throughout southern Punjab, you know, you, you get these mullahs, some with large followings, some with smaller followings, each hawking a different ideology, right? So it's like a flea market. So one person says, we, the first thing that we need to do is we need to expel the infidels from Afghanistan, and that should be our you know, primary area of focus. And it's wrong to fight against the Pakistani state because they're our fellow brothers. And you get another uh, cleric who's saying, but the Pakistani state is working with the Americans, so obviously we need to fight them too. And somebody else is saying, don't you know that the Shia are the greatest enemy? That's where our focus should be first and foremost. And only after we've gotten rid of them can we look at these other issues. The point is that you've got all these different people hawking all these different ideas. And so when people come into the system, they can sort of ping pong around and you can find any type of sanction for any type of activity that you want to do, okay? And you can be convinced by all these different actors. And whereas back in like 2001 or even particularly during the 1990s, and where recruitment was much more above ground and people were drawn to Tanzim's by, uh, jihadist organizations primarily by the dynamics of the India-Pakistan competition and by their own sectarian identity, Diobandi or Ali Hadiths. Increasingly, as recruitment went underground, and that's true, by the way, even for groups that are state-sanctioned, because while LET can still recruit openly, it can't do it as openly as it used to because the Pakistani state is telling it, you guys need to be slightly sly about this, otherwise we're going to hear about it. 
you know, from our interlocutors uh, in, in New Delhi and Washington. So, you know, bring a little bit of subtlety to this. The, the, what, what happens is increasingly, and this is particularly true in, in Punjab, people are drawn to organizations or networks based not on what those networks or organizations stand for, but by who they can access. And in the FATA, they're attracted to Tanzims based on tribe or, you know, or, or who's ever most powerful in the area. So it becomes more of a buyer's market, right? And that's what dictates you get in based on who you can access. And then once you're in, this can shift quite a bit. Um, which is of significant concern for us in the U.S. because, you know, to, to quote Bruce Rydell, these guys no longer stay in their lanes. So where a person is today or what an organization is espousing today isn't necessarily going to be true pr tomorrow. And that lack of predictive power is of significant concern. Now, where do I see this going over the next couple of years? Well, there's good news and there's bad news. Um, the good news is I think that as the U.S. draws down from Afghanistan, even though the war is not going to stop there, right? I mean, just because the U.S. and coalition forces leave doesn't mean the war stops. But as the U.S. draws down, Afghanistan is likely to become less of a focal point for some of these actors. Now, because there's so many diverging ideologies and there's so much internecine competition within this milieu, it's going to be unlikely that they're going to be able to unify behind any one objective and achieve critical mass. That is a positive. The negative is that there's no unifying objective and they're going to continue to compete with one another. We're likely to see a ratcheting effect whereby people are trying to you know, outdo one another in terms of attacks. I would argue we're already seeing that. I would argue that 2611 is a perfect example of a group that had, you know, to a degree, been overshadowed by 2008, Lashkar e Taiba, looking for a way to sort of get itself back, you know, on top. Um, and I think that is going to create a very dangerous scenario as we see that ratcheting effect. And as people move around um, from group to group to group increasingly, on the one hand, the likelihood of being able to pull off a large scale attack potentially decreases because that takes time and everything else. The likelihood of an increasing number of attacks that are a bit more erratic and can have a destabilizing impact increases. And so I think that is a real concern. Now, I would be remiss if I, if I didn't uh, you know, say a few words about what I see to be Pakistani control over this, right? Um, and if I, if I don't say it now, I'm going to get asked the question later. So I might as well just, um, you know, delve in right now. Uh, my sense is this. First of all, um, I personally believe that this concept of control is an illusion. Um, nevertheless, unfortunately, I think it's an illusion that some in the Pakistani security establishment still buy into. Um, this sense that they can, if not necessarily control all of these groups, control at least some of them and through that control the level and direction of violence. That is a very, very dangerous misconception, okay? And it's one of the dangerous misconceptions that informs the fact or informs the decision not to dismantle the entire infrastructure. Several others inform that as well. Um, but, but first, let me just say, I think it is better to look at influence in terms of ha and situational awareness. And I would argue that the Army and the ISI still have significant influence and situational awareness over some groups like Lashkar Taiba, like the Haqqani Network, and have far less over others. It's a spectrum, right? It is, they do not have complete control over anybody, but they certainly have significant influence and ability to leverage, exert leverage and pressure on groups like LET, on the Haqqanis, etc. And then you, it devolves you know, to the other end of the spectrum where you have the guys who are attacking GHQ. Now, one of the issues, of course, is that just because you have leverage over Lashkar leadership and situational awareness over, you know, a lot of elements within the group and operational control over a lot of elements in the group does not mean that that's absolute. The leaders don't have control over everybody. And, you know, I would argue that as with any state, non-state, uh, principal-agent relationship, you have a state constantly trying to exert more 
control and a non-state actor tr constantly trying to distance himself and have more autonomy. And that's where you get concerns about ungoverned space in Fatah. That's where I have significant concerns about Kunar and Nuristan province in Afghanistan, where some of these groups can carve out some turf for themselves. Um, again, I would suggest that the security establishment has made the decision to double down on trying to control some of these actors um, and to kill off or otherwise imprison those or, or make deals with those that they can't control or don't believe they can control, like the TTP and others. Now, here we get into what I see to be some of the barriers to action, right? The first is this belief that some of these groups still have utility abroad, this belief that the Haqqanis have utility for securing what the ISI and the army want to secure in Afghanistan, that LET still has utility against India. And that if, even, if they, even if LET doesn't necessarily have utility against India today, it could have utility tomorrow, right? We still haven't settled Kashmir. Why would we get rid of one of the important chips that we have at the table before that happens? So that's number one. Um, that is, I would argue, the greatest barrier to dismantling the militant infrastructure is this belief that some of these proxies are still controllable and still have utility abroad. And I want to be very clear about that before I get into what I see as the other barriers because I've given this, this type of talk before and people always come back and say, why are you talking about all these domestic things? Don't you know that it's that it's because they want to use it against us. Yes, absolutely. It's the, the proxy utility is number one. That is paramount, but it doesn't end there. There is also a belief in Pakistan among many uh, important uh, officials that part of the reason they are facing violence in their own backyard is as a result of US and Indian pressure to begin cracking down on these groups that they began climbing down the ladder in terms of support for some of these guys and cracking down on others, and look what happened. We lost control of the whole thing. So now you're asking us to crack down even more on groups that are not yet technically at war with the Pakistani state. Why would we go after the Haqqanis and LET when, when they're helpful abroad and they're not attacking us at home? We're just going to make more problems for ourselves, right? And particularly in the case of, of you know, the Haqqanis, they also point to the fact that, look, they're an important interlocutor for us in Fatah with other actors. With LET, they point to the fact that if we were to go after them, they could start launching attacks in Punjab, and our police is ill-equipped to deal with this. We're certainly, we're a Punjabi army. We can't deploy into Punjab province. What would you have us do? And in that regard, you know, to a degree, they're, they're not incorrect. I would argue that the the answer then is to build up your police and your domestic intelligence capacity. We'll come to that in a few minutes. Um, that's the first perception, perception is that it's, I, be, I take them at their word when they say we're, we're engaging in a triage approach. That's what they're doing. They're going after the guys that are actively attacking them and they're not going after the guys that, that aren't. The problem with that, of course, as I've pointed out, is that the infrastructure for even the good jihadists is being used against Pakistan at times, but they're prepared to accept a level of what I would say is slippage um, because they have their own perceptions about these guys. The second um, point that I think is important when talking about how Pakistan views these actors is this perception that some of the violence against the Pakistani state um, and it depends how much, depending on who you speak to, is the result of first raw, second CIA, and third Mossad proxy war, okay? And this conspiracy theory actually, as far as I can trace it back, has an interesting origin, which is when the Pakistanis were trying to initially do the right thing and get their forces to go into the tribal areas to fight against the militants that were based there, they feared that their soldiers wouldn't fight against fellow Muslims, particularly Pakistani Muslims. So what did they do? They said, these guys are raw agents, these guys are CIA agents, these guys are Mossad agents, and so therefore it's okay, you need to go kill them, all right? That gets absorbed into the environment and turned around and fed back out, and it 
it's seized upon by others in Pakistan who are unable to admit that they have created this problem for themselves. It pains me to say that because I, I go to Pakistan, you know, I, I Pakistani friends, I, I will say this in India, I like Pakistan, I mean, I like India too. There is a victim mentality among particularly those in the establishment and so they glom onto this idea of it's raw, it's Mossad, it's CIA. The problem is, once that is internalized by the security establishment, you then see yourself as involved in a proxy battle. And so last summer, I spent four weeks there looking at specifically the threat to the Pakistani state. And I heard again and again and again the same phrase. You, meaning CIA, and you're obviously working with Ra and the Mossad, right? Have your Taliban. TTP, Punjabi Taliban, so we need our Taliban, right? If that is how you are looking at this from a cost-benefit perspective, then of course you're not going to take action. Now it's a completely ridiculous notion, but believed it is nonetheless. And indeed, some of these quote good jihadists, in particular Lashkar-e Taiba, have been used against some of the, quote, bad jihadists. So there have been instances of people in LET being sent out to eliminate people in TTP. People in LET, people sometimes in the Haqqanis, even in Jaish, are asked to gather intelligence about other actors that are attacking the Pakistani state. So these groups that were, again, the primary reason they're not being dismantled is they're perceived to have utility abroad. They are now also seen to have utility at home against what are viewed as proxies for their enemy. This is now external and internal security dynamics, right? It's not just that we do not want to face a backlash from dismantling these guys that are not attacking the pack attacking the state, they're actually useful against the people who are attacking the state. In addition to that, of course, some of these actors also have above ground social welfare organizations or are connected to them. One, the fact that they are involved in social welfare contributes to the perception that they are good Muslims, right? How could they be bad guys? They're good, they're good boys. And so that further skews your perception of where the problem really lies. In addition to that, there are actual political security uh, um, calculations at play as well. The, the economy is shambolic, all right? It's not as though um, any of these militant groups is making an enormous difference in terms of their social welfare activities or anything. But they are contributing and every little bit counts. So there's concerns, particularly when it comes to the Mudaris, about closing those down. I sat across from the Punjabi law minister and he asked me, you know, the somewhat valid question, fine, you've identified, we've identified a hundred problem Mudaris. If we close those down another hundred, they'll spread to another hundred and another hundred. What would you have us do? Have us close down every madrasa in our province and put you know, tens of thousands of students out onto the streets? Then we're gonna face a public order problem. So the weakness of the state to fill that void also contributes, as does the fear that some of these actors, although they are not particularly popular, enjoy suasion in the country, right? So in addition to worrying about the violent response from trying to dismantle the militant infrastructure, which the Pakistanis have experienced firsthand over the last five years um, in the form of thousands of terrorist attacks every year, not just in Fatah, but also in Punjab and Karachi. There's also concerns about, um, you know, a, uh, the ability to, you know, street power, um, to shut down Lahore for a couple of days, things of this nature. That is yet another concern and yet another barrier. Now, I would argue that to a degree, um, these are on their own, you know, used as 
excuses at times because you could overcome them. But the Pakistanis don't want to take the steps, I would argue, necessary to overcome them. I'll, I'll come to that in one sec. I want to just point out one final um, issue with regards to their suasion, which is they deliver vote banks. Okay? Lashkar's above ground organization, Jamaat Dawa, delivers vote banks. Sipi Sahaba Pakistan, which I have talked to police officers and they have referred to as, quote, the mother of all Diobandi jihadist groups and the mother of all terrorism against Pakistan because they're so sectarian and because they feed into all the different groups that are engaged in sectarian and revolutionary jihad. Yeah, the Punjabi law minister appeared on stage with the head of SSP, okay? Um, the guy gets ri driven around in, in a government vehicle. Why? Because he can deliver an important district you know, for National Assembly elections, for Provincial Assembly elections. So, you know, it's not just, is the Army and the ISI the main problem? Yeah, but civilian actors are guilty as well. They are guilty of, um, of farming out security to the Army and the ISI, and they are guilty of taking advantage of militants' popularity for their own political purposes. And now just uh, one brief word on, on capacity, which I think we might get into a bit more during the, the, the discussion, um, which is because of the way in which the system is set up and because of all of these compulsions, there are significant structural barriers, even when the Pakistanis try to take action, all right? The ISI is essentially responsible for counterterrorism, and that is not as it should be. The Intelligence Bureau, the Federal Investigative Agency, and the local police should be responsible for counterterrorism. But there's several reasons they're not. One, the ISI still wants to control who, who you do counterterrorism against because some of these actors have utility abroad. Two, um, you have the normal bureaucratic infighting that, that happens, and, and yeah, well, you and I have discussed this here, um, the ISI not wanting to allow other entities to grow powerful. And then three, um, a lot of this is down to who's in charge. So when Tariq Pervez, who some people in this room may know, a former cop was in charge of, you know, IB, was over at FIA, I mean, you know, when it's somebody who's well respected, they can invigorate these institutions. But when it's not somebody who's well respected, these institutions become sclerotic. And I see no evidence that civilians really care one iota about this, because they continue to use them for political purposes as well as they do with the police, okay? Which remains wholly under-equipped for, for all of these reasons, um, and then some. And so therefore, who is it that's actually going after militants even when they try to do it? It's, it's the ISI. Well, the ISI is not equipped to do that. So what happens when I arrest somebody from the ISI? Well, I arrest them, I torture the living hell out of them for a week, okay, and then I throw them at the cops and I say, go ahead, make a case. And the, you know, I mean, I've literally have, have met cops who've told me, so there I was with these three guys in my hands and the story that I came up with was, I heard them all plotting in the cemetery at two in the morning, so I arrested all of them unarmed and brought them in and now I'm gonna give evidence. And you have a prosecutor who's you know, ill-equipped, ill-trained, you've got no witness protection program, you've got no judge protection program, you've got no prosecutor protection program, you know, and you've got a defense attorney who was probably uh, educated at a law school in my country who's going to waltz in, it's not surprising that 80%, 90% of the people are, are walking out the door, all right? So even when they want to, to take action, they're impeded by that fact and by the fact that when they do see themselves taking action, there's terrorism as a result. And so it feeds into this desire to, again, try to control the situation, try to push it out, you know? We'll continue to try to use them in Afghanistan. We'll continue to try to use them in India. So where does that leave us? And, and here I'll just briefly conclude from a U.S. perspective. Um, one, I think that we are only now coming to grips with the complexity of the problem. I think for a long time our understanding of Pakistani militancy was the bumper sticker, it's all about India, okay? No, India may still be the prime motive factor in maintaining all these groups, but it's become much more complicated. These groups have spread like a cancer throughout the society. This is no longer a tumor that can be excised, all right? This is gonna require long, painful doses of medicine to take the analogy a step further, and the Pakistanis don't wanna take their medicine. 
and they don't really know what medicine to take. So where does that leave us? Well, for a, for a long time we tried to change Pakistan's geopolitical calculation um, in the U.S., and we have absolutely failed at that. We have failed at that because we failed to understand the depth of Pakistan's compulsions when it, when it comes to its neighborhood, India and Afghanistan. Um, we failed because we uh, thought that, you know, once we did understand it, that we could bribe the Pakistanis into changing their compulsions. We failed because we didn't understand what dehyphenation between India and Pakistan as far as U.S. policy was going to mean to the Pakistanis. It means to them, we can work with you, but we're no longer your friends. Um, you know, we failed to understand what their threshold was for pain internally. Um, when I went last year, you know, I was, I was, one of the reasons why I was able to secure some, some sponsorship to go was there was this sense that we might be, uh, be able to find places where the U.S. and Pakistan could work together against some of the militants that were attacking it. And there was a brief period of time where we, where we could, but that time period has passed because of all the compulsions that I've mentioned. And because what we didn't realize was the Pakistanis were prepared to absorb far greater losses than we could have possibly imagined in order to protect what they perceived to be their political and geopolitical interests, okay? The type of violence that was taking place in, in Pakistan would have been completely unacceptable in the U.S. We didn't understand that that was not the case there. And so we didn't understand the cost benefit that was being done. We do now, but we don't know how to change it. Um, the U.S. and India, I would argue, um, used to diverge on our assessment of the problem. And by the way, we still, our primary concern is still killing Al-Qaeda and getting out of Afghanistan, okay? But we recognize now that the entire militant infrastructure is a threat, and we're concerned about it. We are no longer divergent with India in terms of that assessment. Unfortunately, India and the U.S. are now convergent on a com complete loss of what to do about it. Because we can't come up with the right carrots or the right sticks. So there's a significant debate going on, and I don't really know how fully formed that debate is um, in the U.S. And part of the reason I don't know is because when you talk to different agencies, you get a different assessment, right? And you get an even even more virulent assessment of the situation if you talk to people in Congress, right? Um, where you've literally got people saying we should support the Baluch insurgency and try to dismember Pakistan. Um, does not help with U.S.-Pakistan relations, I can tell you. Um, but, but there is a debate going on about um, how to engage. I think we are past the point where we're trying to have a strategic partnership. We floated that balloon, um, the Pakistanis popped it, um, and, and we've, we've moved on. The question then is whether we are going to have more of a distanced engagement, really post-2014. Nothing's going to happen until then. I think the, the goal between now and 2014 is avoid a complete rupture, avoid a major terrorist attack you know, in the region, and get our kit out of Afghanistan to the best degree possible without the whole country going but post-2014, I don't think there's any sense that we can have a real strategic partnership along the lines that was mooted and that informed the Kerry Lugar legislation you know, several years back. The question then becomes, do we seek um, what I would say sort of a, an approach based on determined patience, wherein we try as best as possible to contain the problem, uh, use aid as a door opener to keep the door open, and engage where we can with the civilians, engage to the minimum necessary with the military, you know, and sort of, sort of, you know, maybe let the Pakistanis cycle through their cards and realize that they've go, got nowhere to go um, but to ultimately begin to normalize with India and move beyond, you know, this, these problems and be there with our hand out when, when, when that time comes. Or to start trying to impose costs post-2014, by which I mean, you know, we will threaten to labor you a state sponsor of terrorism. We will sanction certain individuals within the ISI. We will, to the degree possible, ramp up our, you know, covert, covert clandestine activity against Pakistani groups as opposed to just AQ based in Pakistan. 
this is a debate that's going on. I don't think it's settled. Um, you know, my personal feeling is I, to a degree, could get behind either approach. The biggest problem that I have seen with U.S. policy to date has been an utter lack of consistency. It was mentioned at the beginning, the bounty on Hafez Saeed. Listen, I'm no fan of Hafez Saeed, um, and I would very much like to see that guy in prison. I thought that that was a bad move. I thought it was a bad move because it happened right when we were trying to renormalize and reset our own relations with Pakistan, that the announcement was made by a State Department official here in India for no reason that I can assess other than somebody was looking for a nice deliverable. But it was in yet another setback with Pakistan. It was yet another example of the degree to which we have been unable to synchronize our policy. And that is, to me, the biggest challenge, is to find a consistent approach and then stick by it with the very clear-eyed assessment of what that will mean for the U.S. and the region in terms of the potential costs that come with it. Um, let me stop there, um, I, you know, and, and we can sort of open this up to a wider discussion. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit back down there while we do that. Dr. Tankel, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to ORF. It's always a pleasure to address you. Um, I have been seeing this from the government side from uh, the 90, early 90s or middle 1980s. Now, we spoke about the convergence between the policy of the United States and India on this uh, counter-terrorist issue or many other things. Well, I, I was in Washington when we didn't have that much of convergence. I remember on 14 December 1992, I took an Indian intelligence chief to see, to meet Mr. Robert Gates, director of CIA then. We tried to impress upon him the, the problems created by Pakistan's activities. But he tried to balance out and said that, look, I am hearing the same complaints about you from Pakistan. Then we had this 1993 <coughs> Mumbai serial blast where we needed some forensic evidence. And there was impression in uh, Delhi, I was not in the country at that time, I was abroad, that USA could have helped the Mumbai police. Unfortunately, somehow it did not happen. Then in 1993 and 1994, I led the Indian intelligence teams to, for our annual dialogue with the counterparts in the USA, where again I tried to impress upon them about the dangers uh, posed by Pakistan's activities. Well, it's history now. Things have changed. There is convergence. And I was part of the two-member committee to inquire into the 2611. I must say that, but for the U.S. active help, we would not have got all the technical evidence which finally made this investigation epoch-making. One of the best investigations, perhaps, in a similar terrorist case anywhere in the world. So, but for their help, it, we would not have been able to do it. Secondly, I read a, a speech by FBI Director Mr. Mueller, which unfortunately it has not been reported in the Indian media. He was addressing the Council on Foreign Relations on 23rd of February 2009. How much FBI and Mumbai police and our central agencies work together to detect this particular case. Because I have always held that international terrorism cannot be defeated without international cooperation. So this was a classic case. In, in, uh, I was invited in uh, October 2010 to address a seminar in Oxford University. I, there were a number of people all over the world that come. 
there was a Pakistan uh, delegate also who happened to be later a friend of mine, Professor, he was an old Pakistani police officer called Hassan Abbas, who writes and he is now with National Defense University. Earlier he was in the Columbia University. So he and I, we exchanged notes and so I quoted this example as an outstanding example of uh, international cooperation. And when you look at Pakistan, I was having a discussion with Dr. Tankil before that. You see a, a number of disturbing features. First is the unusually strong, defiant statement issued by Pakistan Foreign Office to Defense Secretary Mr. Leon Panetta's charge that there are safe havens in Pakistan. Now, he, they have said that, this is very recent, June 9th, we feel that the Secretary of Defense is oversimplifying some of the very complex issues we are dealing with in our efforts against extremism and terrorism. We strongly believe that such statements are misplaced and unhelpful in bringing about peace and stability in the region. In other words, they want us to accept their definition of terrorism. As he mentioned very eloquently, they are both victims and perpetrators of ter terrorism. Now, my definition, my, my assessment is that their being victims is because of the contradiction of the society, because of the structural imbalance where there is no democratic elements at all. I'll uh, quote some of the po leading Pakistan writers about the same thing, that it is a militarized administration where more and more emphasis are on military means, more powers on the military, which is not an essential ingredient of a democracy. So, the point is, my point, and in fact, I, I want to ask this question also to him, he has partly answered, how do you assess the relationship, present relationship between Pakistan establishment and the jihadis who are operating against India? Well, there is a reluctance to engage or rather to control the Haqqani uh, faction of the Taliban, which is operating against the NATO. But it is equally true that there is a total reluctance on the part of Pakistan government machinery to act against the anti-India jihadis. They, the observers divide the jihadis into anti-NATO and anti-India. Uh, anti now, in this connection, I would like to quote Professor Hassan Abbas, his paper uh, for the U.S. Institute of Peace. He wrote a paper in February 2011, Reforming Pakistan Police. And in fact, this was a theme of his talk in 2010 also, that whatever aid is coming from the United States, the army, Pakistan army is gobbling it up. Hardly any aid is given to the police. The police institutions are not strengthened at all. Although legally, it is the Pakistan police which is supposed to deal with the terrorism, not the army. But they take it away. And if they continue like this, the police will be totally understaffed and under-equipped and they are not able to carry out their uh, functions at all. The same was given by a very recent paper, it was sent to me by a professor of London School of Economics called Adnan Nasimullah. He said the same thing. Elements of Pakistani security elite see the continuing patronage of particular militants as crucial instruments against perceived Indian hostility and an op openly hostile Karzai government in Afghanistan. That means that both their eastern as well as western border, they want to retain these elements in order to supplement their government coercive machinery. So this is not my uh, conclusion, this is a Pakistani, two Pakistani eminent writers. Then the other one is, there was a very good paper which was circulated in December 2011 which uh, Mr. Shuja Nawaz, again a Pakistani 
uh, think tank. Uh, he's from the Atlantic Council, but he wrote this paper for UN Institute of Peace. The paper is called Who Controlled Pakistan Security Forces? Now, his conclusions, he deals with various issues and he, he has said that civilian government, that is the present democratically elected government, has outsourced the internal and external security policy to the military. They have totally neglected the police, although the interior minister keeps on saying that the more police people are killed in the militant attacks. But funding is, it is gobbled up by the military. But his prognosis is all the more disturbing. He has said that during the next three to five years, military influence is likely to increase. Second, economy will not quickly improve. Dr. Tangel also said the same thing. And 2013 elections are unlikely to produce a powerful civilian government. So this is go going to be a lingering problem for India and United States. So b both India and uh, Afghanistan, Afghanistan immediately and to a great extent even United States will also will have to face this particular uh, problem if this assessment is correct. There's another very disturbing uh, tendency which I have personally discussed with the with a former chief of Pakistan Army whom I met in a track to dialogue in May 2010 in Delhi. Dr. Tangel also has mentioned about this. Earlier we were under the impression that the jihadis are patronized by the army as a hidden source of power. That is their unseen Brahmastra, what we call. Brahmastra is the ultimate weapon in Indian mythology. But General so-and-so, I don't want to mention his name, he told me that it's not so. This the civilian political leaders are also using them, especially in Punjab. I asked him this question, General, give me a straight answer, don't talk in a diplomatic way. Why are you not able to control the, your militants? He says, look, look uh, Mr. Balachandran, it can be done in uh, the tribal areas, but we are finding it difficult to do anything in, in the states where uh, there is elected governments, where we don't operate at all. We are going strictly by the canons of uh, democracy that we will not act in any area where there is a popular government. So in Punjab, an average politician, whether it is Muslim League or PPP, is depending upon the jihadi elements. And that is the secret of Jamal Dawa, as he mentioned that. So in other words, are we seeing the whole Pakistani society, except perhaps the middle class, except I have the educated middle class, all being influenced by, all Talibanized by these sections, which is a very, very disturbing thing. So in other words, even if you have an elected government tomorrow, where is the guarantee that they, are, they do not uh, derive the strength from the militancy? So this is a continuing problem for India and for the United States and for the rest of the world. Now, the same thing was in, indirectly mentioned by, as I mentioned, Adnan Nazimullah also, that he quoted an example of how the police was not able to take action against certain militants because uh, Naz, um, Fazlul Rahman, Fazlul Rahman was carrying on peace negotiations with Tahrike Taliban on behalf of the central government. Now, when he, you are doing this, when you want to appease certain militants, how can the police take action against them? So I just flagged these issues and uh, I would like some guidance from Dr. Tankel uh, for us and for all of us. And after that, I think you could ask questions. Thank you very much.